Well, thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you for coming out. Uh, special thank you to you, Dave, for uh, everything that you do to make people healthier and for arranging tonight. And I also want to say a big thank you to Susan and Pamela also for uh, making things work, not only tonight, but this morning and everything else. Thank you for that. Um, thank you to Myra for all your help. And also a big thank you to Seth for making all the food. I was, I was going to pretend that I had been cooking all day, but Seth actually has. So anyway, thank you, Seth. And to greater things to come. Um, okay, let me see if I can figure out how to make this work. The old idea about food and health was that you eat something bad and you get a disease. Like you eat high calorie foods and you get overweight. Or you eat high saturated fat foods and your cholesterol goes up or you eat something bad, you get diabetes. I'd like to rethink that. The idea is that if you eat foods in a certain way, you can actually change the hormones that course through your bloodstream, and they affect everything in your body. And if you can actually control your hormones, as strange as that idea may sound at first, you can control all kinds of things that you thought you couldn't control otherwise. And we're gonna talk about some of that now. Okay, so what the heck are hormones. Hormones are like letters in the mail. They go from one place, they give information to another place. It's like my thyroid makes thyroid hormone that goes to my cells to give me energy. Okay, so what can go wrong? The first thing is I can have not enough hormones, not enough letters in the mail. The second thing is I can have too darn many, where I've got too much thyroid hormone or too much you name it, okay? So in either case, we want to be back in balance. Okay, example number one, insulin. Insulin, as you know, is part of the machinery for getting glucose into our bodies, regulating our blood sugar. And back in 2003, NIH gave our research team a grant to try to see if we could make that insulin hormone work a little bit better. And what we did is we brought in people who had type 2 diabetes. And half of them were assigned to what I'm going to call a portion controlled diet. That's a, a more conventional diabetes diet, or else to a plant-based diet. And what does that mean? Uh, the portion controlled diet is going to be pretty familiar to anybody who's got diabetes. You sit down with a dietitian and they say, you need to lose weight. So cut some calories. You need to keep your glucose kind of steady, so don't eat too much carbohydrate at any given time. Don't eat bad fat. The plant-based diet or the vegan diet was completely different. It did not limit calories at all. It didn't limit carbohydrates at all. It just said no animal products. OK, so it's vegan. Minimize oils and favor low glycemic index foods. Um, don't get hung up on the terms. That just means, uh, say, white bread will spike your blood sugar. That's high glycemic index. Rye bread, lower glycemic index. Beans are low glycemic index. Fruit is low glycemic index, OK? So that's the idea. And to cut to the chase, the test that we use is hemoglobin A1c. And that's a measure of our blood sugar control over the preceding three months or so. And in the portion controlled group, it dropped, that's the red line here, it dropped about 0 0.4 absolute percentage points. The diet's working. But in the vegan group, that's the blue line, it dropped three times more, about 1.2 absolute percentage points, just average. That's a darn good, that, if you had an oral medicine that would reliably do that, that'd be like the best diabetes pill ever. Okay, so this is Vance. Vance was one of our first research participants. When he joined the study, he told me about his life. He'd worked in, he was a policeman. Then he worked in a bank. And he said he joined this study because his grandpa had diabetes, and his grandma had diabetes, and he's got diabetes, and he said, if I don't get this under better control, I'm gonna lose a leg. I'm gonna go blind. 
And he was randomly assigned to the vegan diet. And the first thing he said is, this is a real easy diet. And I thought, wait a minute, most people don't think that. They think vegan, that's got to be tough. That means you have to wear tie-dyed clothes and acquire a taste for folk music and that kind of stuff. He said, no, 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 very simple. Um, instead of meat chili, you have bean chili. Instead of ground beef on my spaghetti, I put tomato sauce on my spaghetti. You don't make me count calories. You don't make me count carbs. You don't make me count anything or limit anything. Easiest diet ever. And over a year's time, he lost 60 pounds. His, do his private doctor said, I can't justify having you on any diabetes medications anymore. They stopped his medicines. And when his A1C value came in, it had been nine and a half, which is not good. And it dropped to 5.3. And for any doctors in the audience, 5.3, is it diabetes? Is it pre -di It's nothing. That is like a 14-year-old kid's hemoglobin A1C. And I want to tell you something. When I got his lab slip, I closed my door in my office, and I paced around for about 10 minutes because I wanted to say, is he cured? Flashback. My dad was a diabetes specialist in Fargo, North Dakota. That's where I grew up. My dad was a cattle rancher who didn't like raising cattle and left and uh, went to medical school and became the diabetes expert for Fargo and all of Eastern North Dakota. And I never once heard my father say that anybody with diabetes ever got better. That wasn't his job. His job was to delay the inevitable complications of this disease. Your eyes are going to get affected. Your feet are going to get affected. You may lose them. Your kidneys are going to be affected. And you're going to die a cardiovascular death. And you're going to die 10 to 15 years earlier than other people. And my dad's job was to slow that down. And every day he'd get home from work about 6.30. He'd sit down in his bag. He'd sit in the chair. I never once heard him say, oh, somebody's not on insulin anymore. You know, it's, this disease has been reversed. That wasn't part of it. But s somehow this is changing. And we started to learn that, that this, this whole course of this disease could change. OK, hold that thought. What is going on? When my dad was in practice, we did not have magnetic, magnetic resonance spectroscopy. This is a scanning technique that allows us to look inside the cell and see what's going on. And I want to share with you what we found. This is a cell. This is a muscle cell. Like I stick a needle in your arm, I pull out one cell. That's it. And it operates on glucose. Glucose is its fuel, like gasoline for your car. But that glucose can't get into the cell. It stays outside. Because the cell is very choosy about what goes in, it won't let the glucose in until you have a key. And that key is insulin. And the insulin from the pancreas goes to the surface of the cell and it opens up little channels to let the glucose come in. And in it comes. And that's great. What could go wrong? What goes wrong is I live in Fargo. And that's my dinner. And that's my breakfast. And that's my, that's my lunch. And I'm eating all this fatty stuff. And the fat adds up. So what? What's, what's fat have to do with diabetes? Here's what it has to do with diabetes. That fat starts getting into the cells. And it builds up. And as it builds up, something happens. Now, now, doctors hate words like fat. It's got only three letters. So we're going to refer to it as intramyocellular lipid. And now that's something. OK. But all it is is fat that you ate that got stuck in your cells. And when it happens, insulin will still attach to the surface of the cell, but it cannot function. It, it, it doesn't work. The cell is insulin resistant. And the patient says, well, I'm not eating any bread anymore. I'm not eating fruit. I'm not eating carbs, but I've still got problems. OK, so what do we do instead? A vegan diet means there's no animal fat in your diet. And if you keep the vegetable oils low, too, something amazing happens, which is the fat starts to dissipate. It starts to go out of the cell. And when the fat gets out of the cell, insulin can function again. And it opens up, and in comes the glucose. Hooray, and everybody's happy. And that's what happened in Vance's body. OK, that's insulin. We've got other hormones, too. How about estrogens, female sex hormones? 
I was sitting at my desk one day, phone rang, and it was a young woman who said, Dr. Barnard, my mother told me I needed to call you. Her mother was a doctor I knew in another part of the country. But this young woman, whose name is Robin, said, every month I get at least one day where the cramps are, I cannot get out of bed, cannot go to work type cramps. Now, for, for many women, menstrual cramps are a real thing. And for maybe one in 10, it's like awful and completely life disrupting. That was her situation. She was calling me because she wanted a Demerol prescription which is heavy duty artillery against pain. And I think she needs a good painkiller for a couple of days so she can function. And I'm happy to provide it. However, I was thinking, okay, but what about the rest of the month? How are we gonna stop this from happening next month? And the month after that, and the month after that. So I suggested something that I don't think any doctor ever suggested to a woman for menstrual pain. I said, let me give you some painkillers for today and tomorrow. But would you like to do an experiment? No animal products for the next four weeks and keep oils really, really low. And she said, I don't get it, but I'll try. She called me back a month later. <clears throat> she said, Dr. Bronner, this is amazing. My period started today and I got nothing. No pain, no nothing. It's amazing. And the next month and the next month, same thing. <clears throat> Unless she would deviate from the diet, then the pain would come back. Okay. I thought, this is good, but this is one person. I need to do a study to see if this holds true. So with my friends at the Georgetown Department of OBGYN, we recruited women who had severe menstrual pain. Half of them went on the same diet. The other half took a supplement, which was actually a dummy pill, a placebo. And then after two months, they switched. The diet group then took the supplement and vice versa. And to make a long story short, it worked. We published the findings in the Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and pain diminished in intensity. It diminished in, uh, in, the, in the duration. Uh, PMS symptoms got better, like bloating and water retention and moodiness. All these things improved. OK, so what do you mean? Why did I come up with this idea to tell a woman that this ought to work for her and that it works in a clinical trial? I want to tell you what was going on in my mind when the phone rang. OK, you hurt. You have bad menstrual cramps. Where is this occurring in your body? That's the uterus in the middle of your screen. And off to the side, you see the ovaries connected with the fallopian tubes. And that little inner lining, that pink inner lining in the very middle, that's the endometrium. It's a little cushion that lines the inside of the uterus. And every month, that kind of expands a little bit like that. Um, and that's normal. Estrogen makes that happen. But what was going through my mind is, what if you've got a little too much estrogen? And it causes that to expand maybe a little too much. And then at the end of the month, with menstrual flow, you get prostaglandin production from it, and that's, that hurts. Okay, and then at the same time, for some people, it's worse. They have endometrial cells outside the uterus. See those things that look like raisins? That's uh, endometrial cells that have escaped. And they're all over the place. They're on the uterus, the ovary, the fallopian tubes. They're even on the intestinal tract. So it hurts. And with your period, you get diarrhea. And you think, what is going on? My whole body is going crazy. And my hypothesis was that estrogen was driving this. And the other thing is I was, she's telling me her symptoms that I was remembering a study. Tufts University in Boston, 1994. They brought in a group of women, 48 women, and they put them on a metabolic ward, and they tested different diets. What would happen if we cut your fat content? What would happen if we increased the fiber in your diet? And they weren't thinking cramps. They were thinking breast cancer. Breast cancer is fueled by estrogen. And if we can control estrogen, by helping large groups of people to eat in a different way. You got big power. So anyway, this was going through my mind and I thought, well, you don't have breast cancer so far as I know, but what you've got is an estrogen-related disorder, maybe. And so I thought, okay. Oh, oh, anyway, let me get to the punchline here. What they found is that in the Tufts University studies, just reducing the fat content of the diet, nothing else, just cutting the fat, reduced 
many different estrogen subfractions, especially, especially estradiol and free estradiol, big stuff, and just increasing fiber. That's roughage, like in beans and vegetables. That does the same. Okay, so to the woman on the phone, I thought, how am I going to cut your fat? Vegan diet, there isn't any animal fat at all. And everything you're eating is from a plant, so it's got maximum fiber. If this works, let's just see. So anyway, educated guess on my part. Um, but my thought was, maybe we can control hormones in this way. Um, back on fiber. You know, fiber is the Clark Kent of the nutritional world. It is such a boring thing. Audiences fall asleep when you say the word fiber. But fiber is big stuff, and here's why. Your liver filters estrogen out of the blood, sends it down into the intestinal tract, and it goes literally down the toilet. Your, your liver is getting rid of excess estrogen. The problem is fiber is essential to this process. If you don't have fiber in your diet, the estrogens are reabsorbed back into the blood. And they keep cycling in what's called enterohepatic circulation over and over and over again until you come to a lecture that says eat a high fiber vegan diet and suddenly stops. The estrogens stop cycling and they're excreted like they are supposed to be. Okay? So that's the idea. That's the reason why we use this to control our hormones. Okay, want to make sure everyone's paying attention. Spam, fiber, or no? No, we sure? Trash can. Okay, that's good. Um, how about this? How about KFC? No? Well, what if you ate the carton? Okay, then there's a little bit. Okay, all right, that's going to go too. Now, there are some things that started out life as a plant, but they became eventually unrecognizable, and they have to go as well. Okay, so, um, cheese. Let me say a special word of condemnation for cheese. Um, cheese comes from a cow, and a little biology 101. Cows do not, I was gonna say cows don't give milk. Cows never give milk. People take their milk. But cows are not able to produce milk, like any mammal, until they have been impregnated, and then they give birth, and then people ship their calves away because we're gonna take the milk. And that's the dairying system. And when they're pregnant, they are, their gestation is about nine months. And they are milked way into the pregnancy. You with me? So they're milking the cow, the cow gets pregnant, they keep milking despite the pregnancy. And what that means is the cow's making lots and lots of estrogen. And the estrogen gets into the blood, plasma, and then into the milk. And every glass of milk you ever drank, every slice of Velveeta you ever gave your child, every bit of yogurt you ever gave to a girl or a boy, it had estradiol in it. That's a biological match for human estradiol. Okay? Now the dairy industry will say, oh, we don't care about that. That's no big deal. Well, there is no such thing as hormone-free milk. It always have estrogens in it. And it may be that it does matter. Gary Fraser's group at Loma Linda University did an interesting study they looked at the population of Seventh-day Adventists, which is a really cool study to, uh, group to look at. And the reason is, first of all, they're very health-conscious people. They're all non-smoking, teetotaling folks. But second, they have a huge range of diet from people who drink a lot of milk and eat a lot of cheese and people who don't have any and everything in between. And so they started analyzing them in a very large group of people. And this will not be on the test, but just real clearly, uh, on the x-axis going across the bottom, that's milk intake. You see that um, half a uh, quarter cup, half cup, one cup, two cups, four cups. And the vertical axis, that's breast cancer. More milk, more cancer. Okay. And when the article was written, they reflected on the fact that milk ingestion affects all kinds of hormonal things, including the ages of menarche, menopause, and many other things as well. And it also is a huge driver of prostate cancer in men. And I don't think it's even really disputable anymore, um, the connection with prostate cancer. With breast cancer, the evidence remains mixed. But with prostate cancer, it's really quite compelling. Um, which is unfortunate because the U.S. government tells men 
to have three glasses of milk every day, just like everybody else, even if they're particularly high risk for prostate cancer. It's all related to industry, has nothing to do with science. Okay, um, but it may be other kinds of cancers too. Researchers in Sweden looked at ovarian cancer and found more milk, more ovarian cancer. In this case, I don't think it's the estrogen. I suspect it's the sugar. Lactose sugar in milk is one of the is an unusual sugar that when you digest it, it releases another, another small sugar called galactose, which you don't find in much of anything um, in nature, but it can attack the ovary and can damage it. And we believe that's probably the driver with ovarian cancer. Um, okay, what if a woman has cancer already? She goes to the doctor. She has hopefully good diagnostics, good therapeutics. What about diet? The Women's Intervention Nutrition Study looked at women who had had breast cancer, over 2,000 of them, and it asked them to change their diet. And what they did was ask them to just cut the fat, kind of like a Tufts University. It wasn't vegetarian or vegan, but kind of halfway there. They cut the fat, and what they found was that you could reduce the risk of, of a cancer recurrence. Not huge, but about a quarter of the cancers that they thought were going to happen never happened. And that was true if your cancer had been estrogen receptor negative or positive. Either way, the diet seemed to help. Okay, right on the heels of that bigger study, the Women's Healthy Eating and Living Study in, out of San Diego recruited more than 3,000 women. They all had had breast cancer. And half of them were asked to follow five a day, five vegetable and fruit servings a day. The other half, eight a day, eight servings of vegetables and fruits and fruit juices and so forth. And the five a day was supposed to be the control group because that's just general good advice. Um, but when they followed the individuals over time, they had all had breast cancer and it looked like both groups did, did pretty well. Both of them did well. And at first the headlines were, doesn't really matter. Give up, there's, there's nothing to, to think about. Diet doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter if you do five a day or eight a day. Won't help you, diet doesn't play any role. Wait, stop, wait. All these women had breast cancer. They all knew the purpose of the study, which was to see if increasing vegetables and fruits help you, helps you to survive. They're all highly motivated, and so what do you think they're gonna do? They're gonna say, thanks for the study assignment, but I think I might have more vegetables and fruits in my diet. And then so researchers then did a little deeper dive. They looked into the comparison group that was supposed to have five a day, and they looked at who was dead or alive after five or 11 years of follow-up. And the group that ate the most vegetables and fruits and was physically active had less than 5% mortality in the follow-up period. But there was a group that didn't eat as many vegetables and fruits, but was physically active, and their mortality was about double. And then there was a group that ate their vegetables and fruits, but they were all couch potatoes. And their mortality was high too. And then there was a group that had lower vegetables and fruits and less physical activity, and they had the highest mortality of all. Now, all of these people were probably more health conscious than the average American, but even in this group, you could see these patterns that the more physically active you are, the more vegetables and fruits you have, the better off you're gonna do. So, okay, wait, what do I do? If I don't wanna die of cancer, or I don't wanna get it in the first place, should I maybe avoid the cheese and the dairy and the hormones that are in it? Should I increase my vegetables and fruits or, or should I exercise, what? And the answer is yes, <laughs> do them all. You don't have to pick. All of these things affect the body in various ways. And it's, we now know, and you, you never know enough to be intellectually satisfied, but you know more than enough to take action in your own life and for your loved ones and for your patients. Okay, um, another word, bad word about dairy. Researchers also looked specifically at high fat dairy and its effect on mortality. And this study came out in 2013 and they showed that even having one high fat serving of dairy a day, that's butter, whole milk, ice cream, cheese. Um, having one or more servings a day would increase cancer mortality about 50%. Already diagnosed, and you're eat, eating this stuff, and sometimes it's a well-meaning oncologist who says just eat whatever you can get down. Eat whatever you like. This is all genetic, has nothing to do with what you're eating. Big mistake, 
Okay, all right. Um, okay, shifting gears. We, talk, we talked about uh, the beginning parts of the reproductive cycle, but what about when a woman's at the end of her reproductive window and she's having menopausal symptoms? What's happening when a woman is sitting in a board of directors meeting and suddenly the room becomes 200 degrees, she's having a hot flash, it's vasodilation. The blood vessels in the skin are suddenly dilating. And this can happen in the middle of the night, like four times. So you wake up and sweat and you, your quality of life is tanking. Um, and you go to the doctor and the doctor says, don't worry, I've got a pill that's gonna make this go away, and it will. It's hormone replacement. But on your way to the CVS to fill your prescription, you look it up on your phone. And the prescribing information says all kinds of really daunting things that are related to the use of hormone replacement therapy. Certain cancers, certain heart problems, and others. And this is a, a matter where doctors argue a lot. They'll say, if I use the smallest dose for the shortest period of time, you might eke out without having any of these problems. But for many women, they say, well, that's not like what I was hoping you'd tell me. Um, is there some way I can do this that's safe? Um, and the answer started to come from Japan. Researchers in Canada went over to Japan in the 1980s, and they interviewed more than 1,000 women. And they found that hot flashes were uncommon. Maybe 15% of the population had them. When they had them, they were mild. They didn't have a word for them. But the question was why, and the first answer was soybeans. Okay, soybeans are consumed in Japan, and soybeans have what are called isoflavones. And isoflavones are what gets the credit for the reduced breast cancer risk we see with soy, but they also were th thought to maybe have the anti-hot flash effect. Maybe, hold that thought. In Japan, something happened. The diet changed. The Golden Arches arrived in, in Tokyo, in Osaka, and Burger King, and Dairy Queen, and everything. Um, and as the diet became a burger diet, hot flashes became much more common, as did diabetes, as did obesity, as did heart disease, as did depression. So what's going on? So it may not be just soybeans. It might be something about the overall diet that's, that's active. If you get in a plane, fly down to Cancun, Mexico, rent a car, and drive two hours west. And there's a city there called Valladolid. And next to it is a little town called Chichimila. And there are many Mayan women who have lived in that area for since time immemorial. And researchers interviewed 118 of them and said, tell me about hot flashes. And the question is, like, what? they didn't report menopausal symptoms. They didn't really have them. I mean, they had menopause, but it was sort of no big thing. And so the question was, why? Now, they don't eat rice. This is not a Japanese diet. They have a grain, it's corn. And they have a bean, but it's not soybeans. They eat black beans. And they eat lots of vegetables, including this one, which is called lechaya, which, um, not many North Americans are too aware of, but it's one of lots of them that they know and use and you can buy in any store down there, okay? And so the question was, all right, soybeans, isoflavones, yes. Healthy diet, that's part of it. What's going on here? My team decided to put this to the test. And we brought in a group of women who all had pretty bad hot flashes and half of them went on a diet and half of them did nothing, randomized. And the diet was really simple, vegan, no animal products, limit oils, and a half a cup of soybeans every day. That was it. And uh, what we asked them to do was to eat from our power plate, the fruits and grains and vegetables and legumes, and take vitamin B12, which you need for healthy nerves and healthy blood. And the first thing that we noticed was that the control group gained weight we started in October, we ran through December, people gained weight, but the intervention group didn't. They lost about eight pounds. That's good. And then when we looked at their moderate to severe hot flashes, they were diminished by about 84%. And many of the women found this absolutely life-changing. Now, 
how many of them were free of hot flashes at the beginning? They, all the women had, mo had moderate to severe hot flashes at the beginning. But at 12 weeks, only 41% had any moderate to severe hot flashes. 60% didn't have any at all in the last week of the trial. With the control group, we didn't see that change. Then we started looking at other things. Aside from the hot flashes, how about physical symptoms or psychosocial symptoms like your mood? And how about sexual symptoms? Sexual symptoms are a big uh, reason for, for estrogens as well, and that improved quite dramatically as well. Okay, so what's this about? We published these findings in a journal called Menopause, um, and since that time we have repeated the trial. And I went into this thinking this might have a mild effect. If you do it the right way, it has a huge effect, um, and which has really been surprising. And for, for many of the women, they were really delighted to be participating, but a lot of them were angry. They said, why haven't people studied this before? This is not like rocket science. Why haven't people done this before? And why do, why do doctors cheerlead for medicines we may not really want? Okay. That's another issue. But the issue now is that we've got things that we can put to, to work if we help women to do it. Okay. Um, let me come back to the question about soy and cancer, because if you talk to other people about soy, they'll say, I know that causes breast cancer. I read it on the internet. Um, but it actually does quite the opposite. We've had much more than enough time to study it. And a meta-analysis published in 2008 showed very clearly that the more soy that women consume, the, high, the, the, the more their breast cancer risk drops. Soy reduces the risk. And the same is true for women who um, have had cancer in the past. The more soy they consume, the less likely they are to ever have this cancer come back and kill them. That's important because a lot of well-meaning, ill-informed oncologists say to cancer patients, now that you've had your treatment, don't have any soy, because I read on the internet that it causes cancer. Um, it does precisely the opposite, and if you tell a woman to avoid soy, you've put her in the highest mortality group. Now, I'm not cheerleading for soy, it's totally optional. You know, you don't have to have it, but the idea that it promotes cancer is exactly the opposite. And the explanation, if people need one, is that we have found there are two different estrogen receptor groups. Estrogen receptor alpha is like the gas pedal in your car. You hook estradiol up to that, cancer uh, proliferates. Estrogen receptor beta, you might think of that as the brake in your car. Um, and the soy isoflavones attached to beta. So if you put your foot down really hard in your car, what happens? Exactly the opposite if you step on the gas or you step on the brake. And soy is the brake. Okay. All right. Um, by the way, in case you felt like making soybeans, here's what you do. Not edamame. They're cute, they're tasty, they're great, great at the restaurant, but that's not what I'm talking about. The reason is they're babies. Edamame is like the juvenile soybean. Leave it on the vine, and when it grows to be a mature soybean like that, the isoflavones are much higher in the mature soybeans. And if you go on Amazon, you'll see all different brands that are non-GMO and organic, and you can get them home, and you throw them in your Instapot or your other pressure cooker, throw them in for about 40 minutes, or if you're old-fashioned like me, you can just cook them up like People cooked soybeans for many centuries in a pot, just soak them the night before, cook them up really well. And then you use them like pine nuts, pine nuts on a salad or in a soup or something. And for extra credit, if you want to, you can roast them. So you can actually buy them in advance already toasted. They're on Amazon called Toasteds, and they're really handy if you fly a lot or if you're traveling a lot and you don't want to have your instant pot with you in the airport, you just throw these in your luggage and you've got all you want, half a cup a day. But you can also do it yourself. Um, you cook them up first, and then you spread them out on parchment on a baking sheet, kind of thin, don't have them all crowded, and stick them in the oven for about an hour um, at 350. And if they are still a little soggy, throw them back in. You want them to be nice and dry. And then you put them in a, a bag or some Tupperware or something, and they last forever. And you can season them with all kinds of stuff you want, and it's the greatest snack. It's kind of like dry roasted peanuts, only healthier. 
Okay, so have fun with that. All right, um, so a healthy diet is vegetables and fruits and whole grains and legumes, and vitamin B12 goes along with it, hopefully. And you need it for healthy nerves and healthy blood cells. You don't need much, but you should take it. Um, by the way, you know, sometimes people think I, I don't need any supplements. I mean, it's not natural to take vitamin B12, and that's kind of true. But you don't live in nature. You live in West Palm Beach. And so because of that, you're, we need to have um, certain supplements. Now, I'm, I'm partly kidding. Um, our forebears lived in West Africa, or I'm sorry, Eastern Africa. Um, and when you're in Eastern Africa, the sunshine hits your skin, and it makes all the vitamin D you could ever want. But then some of our forebears had the bad judgment to leave there and to end up places like Fargo um, or Saskatchewan or Massachusetts or Washington DC where I live or New Jersey of all places. And if you're there, there's big chunks of the time when you're not gonna be in sunlight at all. So your skin can no longer make vitamin D. So you will probably need a vitamin D supplement. B12 is the same story. B12 is made by bacteria, not by animals, not by plants. And before the advent of modern hygiene, there was a lot of B12 around. Those days are gone. And if we lived um, in nature, maybe it wouldn't be an issue, but we don't. So anyway, that's it. It's, that's why we do need some B12. Okay, so in our clinic, we see a lot of people with diabetes, weight problems, hot flashes, dysmenorrhea, you name it. And we talk about how to start a healthy diet. And everyone's a little nervous about that. And that's understandable because we're afraid that we're gonna give up things we love. We break this into two steps, I'm gonna walk you through it. I've never seen anyone unable to do this. Step one, take a week and just check out the possibilities. Think what you would eat if you were following a plant-based diet. And what we do is we give everybody a piece of paper and we ask them to take a week and just write down the things that they would like to eat. And so we give them suggestions like, oatmeal or vegan pancakes or scrambled tofu if you want to get adventurous or the vegan sausage instead of the meat one. And ideas for lunch and dinner like a bean burrito or a veggie burger or whatever the case may be. And then they discover that their favorite Italian restaurant has all kinds of vegan pasta sauces like arrabbiata sauce and marinara sauce and that's, that's pretty good. And Latin American even easier with veggie fajitas and bean burritos and so forth. And Chinese restaurants, they probably got 30 dishes, rice and tofu and vegetables. And Japanese cuisine, extra points, because not only do they have cucumber rolls and asparagus rolls and sweet potato rolls, they're also keeping oil really pretty low for most everything. And then, you know, Taco Bell is not the pinnacle of culinary art, but they do have bean burritos. And if you hold the cheese, that will kind of get you by. Okay, so the patient comes back. I took the week, I made up my list. These are foods that work for me. Great. Now that we've got our list, now let's make a diet change. For the next three weeks, no animal products at all. We're gonna be vegan, but that's easy because you already made your list and you've already stocked up, so see what you do. And at the end of three weeks, the patient says, I got two things to report. One is physically I'm a different person. I lost weight, my digestion is working, I feel better, my glucose is down if they got diabetes. But also, they discover their whole attitude has changed. I haven't had chicken wings in three weeks, I don't care anymore. I don't miss them. And they thought they couldn't live without a Velveeta sandwich, they find they just, they're finding new foods and new websites and new recipes and all kinds of people who are doing the same thing. And they really think it's kind of cool. So. Um, what we do is we break it down to check out the possibilities, do a three-week test drive, and that's basically it. But there are all kinds of bumps in the road, and we help people to negotiate with them. Uh, you've got a wedding in North Carolina. You're going to travel. You're, somebody in your family doesn't like it. They're, they're always kind of small issues, but they do come up, and they're always solvable. Okay, this is my book, Your Body in Balance. Um, and I wrote this because I got all excited about the fact that hormones and not just the ones we've talked about, thyroid hormone and others, testosterone, can be manipulated by changes that we make every day. And my hope is that doctors will be able to use these things and that people will have fun with foods and that we'll be able to hopefully be, be healthier than we may be today. The last thing I just want to talk about for just a couple minutes, if you don't mind, 
is a concept called universal meals. And here's the idea. The world is becoming a lot more diverse. And you can be in any boardroom, any university, any airplane, and there are people from all over the world, from all different demographic groups, and everybody brings their own traditions, their own likes and dislikes, their own needs. And that can affect their dietary choices. Okay, so here I am, I'm in my board meeting, and here's somebody who's gluten-free. And here's somebody else who's allergic to peanuts. And here's somebody else who's got a religious mandate of some type. I don't eat pork. And here's somebody else who's vegan. What the heck do I serve? You know, I've got all different special meals for everybody. Wait a minute. Universal Meals says, how about if I can come up with something that will give everyone a seat at the table? Here's what we did. We decided to skip the problem ingredients. Okay, here's somebody from a Hindu background. Are they going to want beef? I don't think so. Go. Um, I want to get rid of pork for my friends from a Muslim tradition. That's gone. And if somebody is from a Jewish tradition, they don't want the pork or the shellfish. Get rid of that. And somebody might have a peanut allergy. We can get rid of that. Someone else might be gluten-free. We can get rid of that. And there's someone who says, I don't want to eat animal-derived products. So we'll get rid of the dairy and the eggs and the fish and, and even the honey. And so that leaves me with vegetables and fruits and legumes and non-gluten grains. And so we then uh, worked with CIA, the, the other CIA, the Culinary Institute of America, to take these ingredients and make recipes. And then we went, worked with our friends in Hollywood, the Spork sisters, and they developed kind of higher end versions of it. And what they came up with was just really cool, like golden pancakes um, and sweet potato hash and a really delicious lentil soup. And if you think about it, all these things work for everybody. Um, or a tortilla soup or a clear vegetable soup. These are arancini balls. It's an Italian traditional food. And this is in my fancy restaurant, but I can also put them on my air airline. Or here's my veggie burger on my airline, and here it is in my restaurant. And so we developed these in small portions and industrial sized portions, and we're now giving it away free, um, and including desserts. And so my suggestion is any place that works with a diverse population, university, a business, a school, anybody can do this. And one population that I want to work with now especially is prisons, because there are people who have got all kinds of issues. Everything is going against you. While you're there, what if you actually had something healthful that could bring, help, help you to, to recover at least that part of, of, of your life? Well, right now, they're all really budget conscious, and they're missing out on everything else. So we have a special thing called UM Thrifty. Every meal is less than a buck and can work for anybody who's really budget conscious. So if you know anybody who likes Universal Meals, it's at our website. And please have a look. And we'd love to have you try it out and introduce it where you are. Um, we unveiled it at the University of Miami. And then uh, Notre Dame did it. Dartmouth uh, has done it. Lots of universities are kind of the first adopters, but lots of them are picking it up. But there's no reason that any place can't do it. And where I'm really hoping is that airlines will do it. So when you're racing for the plane because your other one was canceled and you're on a new one that does not have your special meal, they'll say, relax. Everybody's got a seat at this table. OK, so that's it. That's all I want to say. I just want to finish by saying thank you so much for uh, allowing us to come and share some time with you here in Florida. It's great to be back. It's great to be back in person, and I look forward to continuing to work with you on the cause that we share. Thank you so much. Thanks.